The Old Forge was named Britain's most remote pub by the Guinness Book of World Records. It's located here in Noydart, northern Scotland. Nearly everyone who tries to get there dies in the flames. Okay, this isn't Mordor, but it is tricky. As we found out, one does not simply walk to the Old Forge pub. Plan one, we take the train. Isn't that the train from Harry Potter? Oh, it is. So we pack our gear, jump on the train. Enjoy the breathtaking scenery. Arrive at the Old Forge. Order a pint and... <sighs> no, 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 it doesn't work. The train doesn't come to Neudrat. It hands in Malik Terminal. Hey, wait, who is this guy? My name is JP Robinet and I'm the remotest publican in mainland Britain. Oh, okay. Plan two, we'll walk. Here's the plan. We pack our gear. Fill up our water bottles. We'll pack some snacks. Prepare for the Scottish wilderness. Enjoy the breathtaking scenery. Arrive at the Old Forge. Order a pint and... <sighs> well, you could. But to be honest, I don't think you would because it is 18 miles hike and it's very boggy. No tracks, just cross country through the highlands. And you could carry all your gears all the way up. I don't know, it's quite difficult. It's two days hike, one night in a buffy. Okay, plan three. We drive. We pack up our gear. We hire a car. Make it a four by four and hit the road. Enjoy the breathtaking scenery. Arrive at the old forge, order a pint and... <sighs> it's totally impossible to drive here. The nearest road is 18 miles from here. So you need to park in Mali and jump on a boat. <gasps> Full time, I would say around 130 people live on the peninsula. Of course, the tourism is the main part of our business. We're really busy between the 1st of March and mid-October. We've got the backpackers and hikers because we're on a, one of the two best hikes in Scotland here. Here is totally unspoiled. Noydard is clearly the last British wilderness. Okay, final plan. We take the ferry. We pack our gear, buy a ticket. Get on the ferry. Enjoy the breathtaking scene. Oh my God, there are three whales right next to the boat. Wow. Literally. Arrive in Noidart, wave goodbye to the ferry captain, arrive at the old forge, order a pint, and... Congratulations! You made it. There's a ramen shop on Rishiri Island off the northern tip of Japan. To get there from Tokyo, fly two hours to Sapporo. From there, take the train to Wakani, the northernmost city in Japan. You then catch a ferry to Rishiri Island. Make your way to the western part of the island, and once you're there, let's hope you're on time. It's only open two and a half hours a day. But the trip is worth it, because the place is said to have some of the best ramen in all of Japan. When it comes to ramen in Japan, there are a few places whose names will draw people from all around the world. Ramen Miraku is one such place, and visitors come for this special charred soy ramen made with local kombu seaweed broth. Esashika Takamasa to imasu. Eh, watashi ga itonande iru ramen ya no namae wa Rishiri Ramen Miraku to imasu. 2007 nen kara eh eiyo shite orimasu. Ima no chichi de ichi dai mei narimasu node, eh kono jimoto no Rishiri kombu no aji o and this is no instant ramen. Making the dish takes hours. First, じっくりと出汁を抽出します。で、出来上がったスープを一つに合わせて少し寝かせ。で、その焼きを入れた醤油の香りとスープを合わせて甘さと塩っぱさ、香ばしさがちょうどいいバランスになるように作ってます。The question of course, why do you think people come all this way? それは間違いなくあの地元の 
ちのラーメンは美味しいです。Our turn. One charred ramen, please. どうぞ召し上がってください。Oh, wow. This is good. There's really no difference between here and home. It's just everything's compacted down to a 14 by 14 room. Once you start staffing your lookout, you're going to be working 10 days on, 4 days off, late June until usually mid September. It's a pretty quiet existence. This is my 24th season as a fire lookout. Really, it's just you and the wind, and the time just melts away. My name is Lee Faugen, and we're at Toma Lookout. A fire lookout is a structure that sits on top of a mountain or ridge top that has a good view of the surrounding country. And the staffer then is tasked with living there for extended periods to watch for fire. It's funny because I get a lot of questions about the standard day. You wake up with the sun. I mean, it's hard to sleep in a room of glass much beyond sunrise. First thing I'll do is make a cup of coffee. And usually I'll have that first cup of coffee on the front porch. Sit out there, watch the sun come up. Certainly every morning I go out for a walk. I check in at 10. Hello, guys. Good morning. Go ahead. Hey, good morning. I have 67 degrees. I take the weather every day at 2. Winds are calm. Skies are clear. And check out at 4 15. I think the solitary nature when there's really no fires going, the only thing I might do is check in on the radio twice a day. That might be the only time I really talk unless I'm talking to myself. I think what's so tricky sometimes talking about the lookout experience is you're not talking to anybody about it. So you more intuit it, you more experience it. I think that's why I always use the term resonance because you just can feel it and sense it. Maybe that's fanciful, but it certainly is the way I feel about it. You know, you just find yourself sitting on the porch watching the world go by for hours on end. It's, it's beautiful. When you look at, you know, the lifestyle of a fire lookout, it can be a hard choice at times, too. You know, I'm missing a wedding tonight. Over the course of summer, you might miss a lot of stuff in your life. But certainly every summer I keep coming back because living on top of a mountain for days on end is just such a beautiful chance at making a life of it. We're four days walk from the nearest road. The landscape's vast, the wilderness is Almost unlimited. The access is by aircraft, on foot, or on the right day you can boat it, but it's a challenge in itself. Really, we are at the mercy of the weather and the tides in our day to day life. It's difficult living out here, but if you do what's needed and everything comes together, it's a really rewarding place to be. Warwick Mitchell lives in Fjordland, New Zealand's oldest and largest national park. It covers over 12,000 square kilometers, but is home to only a few dozen people. The park's massive mountain range isolates Warwick from civilization. Living out here, like everywhere, you need shelter, a good dry camp. We have solar panel for power, lighting, and、uh, our satellite communications. We have a quad bike, we have two boats for fishing and diving, and we have the freezer, which keeps our food and our produce cold. We rely on rainwater for drinking water, so that's not too hard with seven meters of rainfall annually. We largely live off the land. When you're living off the land, you're really at the mercy of、uh, the weather and the elements. So、um, there's certain times that will allow you to go out and harvest the deer or catch a fish, capture the menu. If you 
you have a down day and the waves are really good, you're more than likely going to go surfing. If the waves aren't good but the river's looking nice, you might catch a trout. If the waves are flat but the ocean's calm, you might go sea fishing. If the ocean's stormy, you might go up the river for a kayak or go through the bush and see if you can spot a deer. Living in the wilderness doesn't mean you're living in isolation from people. We certainly couldn't be doing what we do if it wasn't for the pilots and our neighbours and our friends. Whether it's the harshness of the environment and being so isolated that brings people together, or the fact that the people that are willing to travel this far have like-minded uh, passion for the environment and the outdoors. One thing's for sure over the years is that the community's become really tight-knit. Can you go ahead and turn this main switch on and we'll just see if she wants to work? Oh no. When things break or things don't go your way, it's always really important to remember you're in the green. The experience is being out here and enjoying being out here. Everything else is a bonus, so you can't get too serious if one thing breaks. I don't know too many places in the world where you can stand on a boat looking back and you can just see ocean leading into forest, leading into massive snow-capped mountains and glacier-shaped bays with pristine rivers and clear water. The trees are as they were 200 years ago. And the people that I bring out here, they get to experience this nature as it was and as it should be. And we try to keep the area and the environment pristine in this little corner of New Zealand.